Egg Archipelago, 1918 to 1956. An Experiment in Literary Investigation by Alexander I. Solzhenitsyn. Translated by Thomas P. Whitney. Copyright 1973 by Alexander I. Solzhenitsyn. English Language Translation, Copyright 1973-1974 by Harper and Row Publishers, Incorporated. This recording of the reading of the Gulag Archipelago was published by arrangement with Harper and Row Publishers, Incorporated, and was produced in 1989 by Blackstone Audio Books, which holds the copyright there too. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Blackstone Audio Books Incorporated. The Gulag Archipelago, Volume 1. This volume is 615 pages long and contains two parts. The Prison Industry, which consists of 12 chapters, and Perpetual Motion, which consists of four chapters. The volume is read in two sections. The first took us through Chapter 6 of the prison industry. The second picks up with Chapter 7 and takes us to the end of Volume 1. And now, the Gulag Archipelago, Volume 1, Section 2. Chapter 7. In the Engine Room. The box adjacent to the so-called Butyrki station was the famous frisking box where new arrivals were searched. It had space enough for five or six jailers to process up to twenty zecks in one batch. Now, however, it was empty, and the rough-hewn search tables had nothing on them. Over at one side of the room, seated behind a small nondescript table beneath a small lamp, was a neat black-haired NKVD major. Patient boredom was what his face chiefly revealed, the intervals during which the Zeks were brought in and led out one by one were a waste of his time. Their signatures could have been collected much, much faster. He indicated that I was to sit down on the stool opposite him on the other side of his table. He asked my name. To the right and left of the inkwell lay two piles of white papers the size of a half sheet of typewriter paper, all looking much the same. In format, they were just like the fuel requisitions handed out in apartment house management offices or warrants in official institutions for purchase of office supplies. Leaping through the pile on the right, the Major found the paper which referred to me. He pulled it out and read it aloud to me in a bored patter. I understood I had been sentenced to eight years. Immediately he began to write a statement on the back of it, with a fountain pen to the effect that the text had been read to me on the particular date. My heart didn't give an extra half-beat. It was all so everyday and routine. Could this really be my sentence, the turning point in my life? I would have liked to feel nervous to experience this moment to the full, but I just couldn't. And the Major had already pushed a sheet over to me, the blank side facing up, and a schoolchild seven-kopeck pen with a bad point that had lint on it from the inkwell lay there in front of me. No, I have to read it myself. Do you really think I would deceive you? The Major objected lazily. Well, go ahead. Read it. Unwillingly, he let the paper out of his hand. I turned it over and began to look through it with a deliberate slowness, not just word by word, but letter by letter. It had been typed, but what I had in front of me was not the original, but a carbon. Extract from a decree of the OSO of the NKVD of the USSR of July the 7th, 1945, number blank. They had meant to sentence me on the very day of the amnesty. The work must go on. All of this was underscored with a dotted line, and the sheet was vertically divided with a dotted line. Case heard, on the left-hand side of the dotted line. Accusation of so-and-so, name, year of birth, place of birth. On the right-hand side of the dotted line, decreed. To designate for so-and-so, name, for anti-Soviet propaganda, and for an attempt to create an anti-Soviet organization, eight years in corrective labor camps. Copy verified, secretary, and then his name. Was I really just supposed to sign and leave in silence? I looked at the major to see whether he intended to say something to me, 
whether he might not provide some clarification. No, he had no such intention. He had already nodded to the jailer at the door to get the next prisoner ready. To give the moment at least a little importance, I asked him with a tragic expression, But really, this is terrible. Eight years? What for? And I could hear how false my own words sounded. Neither he nor I detected anything terrible. Right there. The Major showed me once again where to sign. I signed. I could simply not think of anything else to do. In that case, allow me to write an appeal right here. After all, the sentence is unjust. As provided by regulations, the Major assented with a nod, placing my sheet of paper on the left-hand pile. Let's move along, commanded the jailer. And I moved along. I had not really shown much initiative. Georgi Tenno, who to be sure had been handed a paper worth twenty-five years, answered, After all, this is a life sentence. In olden times they used to beat the drums and assemble a crowd when a person was given a life sentence. And here it's like being on a list for a soap ration. Twenty-five years and run along. Arnold Rappaport took the pen and wrote on the back of the verdict, I protest categorically this terroristic illegal sentence and demand immediate release. The officer who had handed it to him had at first waited patiently, but when he read what Rappaport had written, he was enraged and tore up the paper with the note on it. So what? The term remained in force anyway. This was just a copy. Vera Koryeva was expecting fifteen years, and she saw with delight that there was a typo on the official sheet. It read only five. She laughed her luminous laugh and hurried to sign before they took it back. The officer looked at her dubiously. Do you really understand what I read to you? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Five years in corrective labor camps. The ten-year sentence of Janos Rojas, a Hungarian, was read to him in the corridor in Russian without any translation. He signed it, not knowing it was his sentence, and he waited a long time afterward for his trial. Still later, when he was in camp, he recalled the incident very vaguely and realized what had happened. I returned to the box with a smile. It was strange. Each minute I became jollier and more relieved. Everyone was returning with ten-ruble bills, including Valentine. The lightest term in our group that day had been given the bookkeeper who had gone out of his mind. He was still, in fact, beside himself. And the lightest term after his was mine. In the splashes of sun and the July breeze, the little twig outside the window continued to bob up and down as gaily as before. We chattered boisterously. Here and there, more and more frequently, laughter resounded in the box. We were laughing because everything had gone off so smoothly. We were laughing at the shocked bookkeeper. We were laughing at our morning hopes and at the way our cellmates had seen us off and arranged secret signals with us to be transmitted via food parcels. Four potatoes or two bagels. Well, anyway, there is going to be an amnesty, several affirmed. All this is just for form's sake, and it doesn't mean anything. They want to give us a good scare, so we'll keep in line. Stalin told an American correspondent, What was his name? I don't remember his name. So they ordered us to take our things, formed us up by twos, and led us once again through that same marvellous little park filled with summer. And where did they take us? Once again, to the baths. And oh, what a peal of laughter that got. My God, what silly nincompoops. Still roaring, we undressed, hung our duds on the same trolley hooks and rolled them into the same roaster they'd already been rolled into that very morning. Roaring, each of us took a small sliver of repulsive soap and went into the spacious resonant shower room to wash off our girlish gaiety. We splashed about in there, pouring hot, clean water on ourselves, and we got to romping about as if we were school kids who had come to the baths after their last exam. This cleansing, relieving laughter was, I think, not really sick, but a living defense for the salvation of the organism. As we dried ourselves off, Valentine said to me reassuringly, intimately, Well, all right, we're still young. We're going to live a long time yet. The main thing is not to make a misstep now. We are going to a camp and will not say one word to anyone so they won't plaster new terms on us. We will work honestly and keep our mouths shut. 
and he really believed in his program, that naive little kernel of grain caught between Stalin's millstones. He really had his hopes set on it. One wanted to agree with him, to serve out the term cosily, and then expunge from one's head what one had lived through. But I had begun to sense a truth inside myself. If in order to live it is necessary not to live, then what's it all for? One cannot really say that the OSO had been conceived after the revolution. Catherine the Great had sentenced the journalist Novikov, whom she disliked, to fifteen years on, one might say, an OSO basis, since she didn't turn him over to a court. And all the Tsars, once in a while, in a fatherly way, exiled without any trial those who had incurred their displeasure. In the 1860s, a basic court reform took place. It seemed as if rulers and subjects had both begun to develop something like a juridical view of society. And yet in the 70s and 80s, Korolenko tracked down cases where administrative repression had usurped the role of judicial judgment. In 1872, he himself and two other students were exiled without trial on the orders of the Deputy Minister of State Properties, a typical case of an OSO. Another time, he and his brother were exiled without trial to Glazov. Korolenko has also given us the name of one Fyodor Bogdan, an emissary from the peasants, a Kordok, who got right up to the Tsar himself and was then exiled. And of Payankov, too, who was acquitted by a court and yet exiled by order of the Tsar. And there were several others as well. And Vera Zasulich explained in a letter sent out she emigrated that she had not run away from the court and a trial, but from non-judicial administrative repression. Thus, the tradition of the dotted line, the administratively issued sentence, dragged on. But it was too lax. It was suitable for a drowsy Asiatic country, but not for a country that was rapidly advancing. Moreover, it lacked any definite identity. Who was the OSO? Sometimes it was the Tsar, sometimes the Governor, sometimes the Deputy Minister. And if it was still possible to enumerate names and cases, this was not, begging your pardon, real scope. Real scope entered the picture with the Twenties, when permanently operating troikas, panels of three operating behind closed doors, were created to bypass the courts permanently. In the beginning, they even flaunted it proudly, the troika of the GPU. Not only did they not conceal the names of the members, they publicized them. Who on the Solovetsky Islands did not know the names of the famous Moscow troika, Gleb Boki, Bull, and Vasiliev? Yes, and what a word it was, in fact, troika. It bore a slight hint of sleigh bells on the shaft bow, the celebration of Shrodetide, and interwoven with all this, a mystery. Why? Troika. What did it mean? After all, a court wasn't a quartet, either. And a troika wasn't a court. And the biggest mystery of all lay in the fact that it was kept out of sight. We hadn't been there. We hadn't seen it. All we got was a piece of paper. Sign here. The troika was even more frightening than a revolutionary tribunal. It set itself even farther apart, muffled itself up, locked itself in a separate room, and, soon, concealed the names of its members. Thus we grew used to the idea that the Troika members didn't eat or drink or move about among ordinary people. Once they had isolated themselves in order to go into session, they were shut off for good, and all we knew of them were the sentences handed out through typists. And they had to be returned, too. Such documents couldn't be left in the hands of individuals. These Troikas... We use the plural just in case because, as with a deity, we never know where or in what form it exists, satisfied a persistent need that had arisen, never to allow those arrested to return to freedom. This was like an OTK, a Department for Quality Control in Industry, but in this case it was attached to the GPU to prevent any spoiled goods. If it turned out that someone was innocent and could therefore not be tried at all, then let him have his minus 32 via the Troika, which meant he couldn't live in any of the provincial capitals, or let him spend two or three years in exile, after which he would have a convict's clipped ear, would always be a marked man, and from then on a recidivist. 
Please forgive us, reader. We have once more gone astray with this rightest opportunism, this concept of guilt and of the guilty or innocent. It has, after all, been explained to us that the heart of the matter is not personal guilt but social danger. One can imprison an innocent person if he is socially hostile, and one can release a guilty man if he is socially friendly. But lacking legal training, we can be forgiven. For the 1926 Code, according to which, my good fellow, we lived for 25 years and more, was itself criticised for an impermissible bourgeois approach for an insufficiently class-conscious approach, and for some kind of bourgeois weighing of punishments in relation to the gravity of what had been committed. Alas, it is not for us to write the absorbing history of this particular organ, how the Troikas turned into OSOs, or when they got renamed, or whether there were OSOs in provincial centres, or just one of them in the Great Palace, or which of our great and proud leaders were members or how often they met and how long their sessions lasted, whether or not they were served tea while they worked, and if they were, what was served with the tea, and how the work itself proceeded, did they converse while it was going on or not. We are not the ones who will write this history because we don't know. All that we have heard is that the essence of the OSO was triune, and even though it is still impossible to name its industrious members, Yet we do know the three organs permanently represented there. One member represented the Central Committee of the Party, one the MVD, and one the Chief Prosecutor's Office. However, it would not be a miracle if we should learn some day that there were never any sessions, and that there was only a staff of experienced typists composing extracts from non-existent records of proceedings, and one general administrator who directed the typists. As for typists, there were certainly typists, that we can guarantee. Up to 1924, the authority of the Troika was limited to sentences of three years maximum. From 1924 on, they moved up to five years of camp. From 1937 on, the OSO could turn out ten ruble bills. After 1948, they could rivet a quarter, twenty-five years on you. And there are people... Chavdarov, for example, who know that during the war years the OSO even sentenced prisoners to execution by shooting. Nothing unusual about this. The OSO was nowhere mentioned in either the Constitution or the Code. However, it turned out to be the most convenient kind of hamburger machine, easy to operate, undemanding, and requiring no legal lubrication. The Code existed on its own, and the OSO existed on its own, and it kept on deftly grinding without all the code's 205 articles, neither invoking them nor even mentioning them. As they used to joke in camp, there is no court for nothing. For that, there is no SO. Of course, the OSO itself also needed for convenience some kind of operational shorthand, but for that purpose it worked out on its own a dozen letter articles which made operations very much simpler. It wasn't necessary when they were used to cudgel your brains trying to make things fit the formulations of the code, and they were few enough to be easily remembered by a child. Some of them we have already described. ASA, anti-Soviet agitation. KRD, counter-revolutionary activity. KRTD, counter-revolutionary Trotskyite activity. And that T made the life of a Zek in camp much harder. PSH. Suspicion of espionage, espionage that went beyond the bounds of suspicion, was handed over to tribunal. SVP, SH, contacts leading to suspicion of espionage. KRM, counter-revolutionary thought. VAS, dissemination of anti-Soviet sentiments. SOE, socially dangerous element. S.V.E., socially harmful element. P.D., criminal activity, a favorite accusation against former camp inmates if there was nothing else to be used against them. And then finally, there was the very expansive category. C.H.S., member of a family of a person convicted under one of the foregoing letter categories. 
It has to be remembered that these categories were not applied uniformly and equally among different groups and in different years. But, as with the Articles of the Code and the sections in special decrees, they broke out in sudden epidemics. There is one more qualification. The OSO did not claim to be handing down a sentence. It did not sentence a person, but instead imposed an administrative penalty. And that was the whole thing in a nutshell. Therefore, it was, of course, natural for it to have juridical independence. But even though they did not claim that the administrative penalty was a court sentence, it could be up to 25 years and include deprivation of titles, ranks and decorations, confiscation of all property, imprisonment, deprivation of the right to correspond. Thus a person could disappear from the face of the earth with the help of the OSO even more reliably than under the terms of some primitive court sentence. The OSO enjoyed another important advantage in that its penalty could not be appealed. There was nowhere to appeal to. There was no appeals jurisdiction above it and no jurisdiction beneath it. It was subordinate only to the Minister of Internal Affairs, to Stalin and to Satan. Another big advantage the OSO had was speed. This speed was limited only by the technology of typewriting. And last but not least, not only did the OSO not have to confront the accused face to face, which lessened the burden on interprison transport, it didn't even have to have his photograph. At a time when the prisons were badly overcrowded, this was a great additional advantage because the prisoner did not have to take up space on the prison floor or eat free bread once his interrogation had been completed. He could be sent off to camp immediately and put to honest work. The copy of the sentence could be read to him much later. It used to be that in favourable conditions the prisoners were unloaded from freight cars at their destinations, and they were made to kneel down right there, next to the tracks, as a precaution against attempted escape. But it looked as if they were praying to the OSO, and then and there their sentences were read out to them. It could also happen differently. In 1938, those who arrived at Peribori on prisoner transports did not know either their code articles or their sentences, but the clerk who met them knew, and he looked them up on the list. S.V.E., socially harmful element, five years. That was during the time when there was an urgent need for many hands to work on the Moscow-Volga Canal. Others worked in the camps for months without knowing their sentences. After this, as I. Dobriak reported, they were solemnly lined up, and not just on any old day, but on May the 1st, 1938, when the red flags were flying, and the Stalino province Troika's sentences were announced. This would indicate that the OSO did get decentralized in times of heavy load. These sentences were from 10 to 20 years apiece, and in that same year, my former camp foreman, Sinebriokov, was sent off with a whole trainload of unsentenced prisoners from Chelyabinsk to Cherepovets. Months passed, and the Zeks worked away, and then... One rest day in winter. Note the days, another advantage of the OSO. When the frost was cracking, they were driven out into the courtyard and lined up. A newly arrived lieutenant appeared and introduced himself as having come to inform them of their OSO penalties. But he turned out to be a decent sort because he squinted at their thin footwear and at the sun's rays in the steaming frost and said, Well, anyway, men, why should you freeze out here? The OSO gave you all ten years apiece. There are just a very, very few who got eight. You understand? Disperse. But in view of the frankly mechanical operation of the special board, why have any courts at all? Why use a horse car when there's a noiseless modern street car available, which no one can jump out of? Is it a matter of keeping the judges well fed? Still, it is really quite indecent for a democratic state not to have courts. In 1919, the Eighth Congress of the Party proclaimed in its program, Efforts must be made to involve all the working population in the exercise of judicial duties. It did not prove possible to involve all the working population. Conducting a trial is a delicate business, but there was no question of getting along entirely without courts. However, our political courts, the special collegia of provincial courts, the military tribunals, and why, actually, should there be military tribunals in peacetime anyway? And all the Supreme Courts, too, unanimously followed the path of the OSO. 
They, too, did not get stuck in the mud of public trials or in arguments between sides. Their primary and principal distinguishing feature was closed doors. They were, first of all, closed courts for their own convenience. And by now we have become so accustomed to the fact that millions and millions of people were tried in closed sessions and have become used to this for so long that now and then some mixed-up son, brother or nephew of a prisoner will even snort at you with conviction. And what would you have wanted? There's information here. Our enemies will find out. You can't do it. Thus the fear that our enemies will find out makes us clamp our head between our own knees. Who in our fatherland, except some bookworms, remembers now that Karakudzov, who fired at the Tsar, was provided with a defense lawyer? Or that Zhelyabov and all the Narodnaya Volya group were tried in public without any fear that the Turks would find out? Or that Vera Zasulish, who attempted to kill the official who was, translated in Soviet terms, the chief of the Moscow administration of the MBD, although she missed, and the bullet went past his head, not only was not destroyed in a torture chamber, but was acquitted in open court by a jury, no troika, and then went off in triumph in a carriage. Despite these comparisons, I do not at all mean to say that a perfect system of courts and justice ever existed in Russia, in all probability, an excellent judicial system is the last fruit of the most mature society, or else one needs a Solomon. Vladimir Dahl notes that in the period before the emancipation of the serfs, Russia had not one single proverb containing any praise of the courts. And that really means something. It seems likely that they never had time to get around to making up a proverb praising the Zemps for chiefs either. But, nevertheless, the judicial reform of 1864 at least set the urban sector of our society on the road toward those English models which Hetzen praised so highly. Saying all this, I still have not forgotten what Dostoevsky had to say in his diary of a writer against our trials by jury, about the excesses of some lawyer's eloquence. Gentlemen of the jury, what kind of woman would she have been if she had not stabbed her rival... Gentlemen of the jury, who among you would not have thrown the child out of the window? And the risk that a juror's momentary impulse might outweigh his civic responsibility. But spiritually, Dostoevsky far outstripped the realities of our life, and he worried about what he shouldn't have worried about. He believed that we had achieved open trials once and for all. Indeed, who among his contemporaries could have believed in the OSO? And somewhere else he writes, it is better to err on the side of mercy than on that of the death penalty. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Excesses of eloquence do not afflict exclusively a judicial system in process of being established. Even more conspicuously, they afflict an already established democracy that has not yet discovered its moral goals. England again gives us examples, as when, for partisan advantage, the leader of the opposition does not hesitate to blame the government for a national predicament worse than actually exists. Excesses of eloquence are a malady, but what word can we then use for the excessive use of closed doors? Dostoevsky dreamed of a court in which everything essential to the defense of the accused would be set forth by the prosecutor. How many eons will we have to wait for that? Our social experience has so far enriched us immeasurably with defense lawyers who accuse the defendant. As an honest Soviet person, as a true patriot, I cannot but feel repugnance at the disclosure of these evil deeds. And how comfortable it all is for the judges in a closed session. Judicial robes are not required, and one can even roll up one's sleeves. How easy it is to work. There are no public address systems, no newspaper men, and no public... Well, there is a public, an audience, but it consists of interrogators. For example, they used to attend the Leningrad province court during the day to find out how their protégés were conducting themselves, and at night went calling on those prisoners who needed to have their consciences appealed to. C.H. Blank N's group. The second main characteristic of our political courts is the lack of ambiguity in their work, which is to say, predetermined verdict. That same collection, edited by A.Y. Vyshinsky, 
includes materials indicating that the predetermination of verdict is an old, old story. In 1924 to 1929, sentences were determined by joint administrative and economic considerations. Beginning in 1924, because of national unemployment, the courts reduced the number of verdicts which sentenced prisoners to corrective labour while they continued to live at home and increased short-term prison sentences. These cases involved only non-political offenders, of course. As a result, prisons were overcrowded with short-termers serving sentences of up to six months, and not enough use was being made of them in labour colonies. At the beginning of 1929, the People's Commissariat of Justice of the USSR, in Circular No. 5, condemned short-term sentences, and on November the 6th, 1929, the eve of the 12th anniversary of the October Revolution, when the country was supposedly entering on the construction of socialism, a decree of the Central Executive Committee and the Council of People's Commissars simply forbade all sentences of less than one year. In other words, you, a judge, always know what the higher-ups expect of you. Furthermore, there's a telephone if you still have any doubts. And following the example of the OSOs, sentences might even be typed out ahead of time, with only the prisoner's name to be added later by hand. And in 1942, Strakovich cried out during a session of the military tribunal of the Leningrad military district, But I could not have been recruited by Ignatovsky when I was only ten years old. But the presiding judge barked back, Don't slander the Soviet intelligence service. The whole thing had been predetermined long before. Each and every one of the Ignatovsky group was to be sentenced to be shot. Some man named Lipov got included in the group, but no one from the group knew him, and he knew none of them either. Well, so, all right, Lipov got ten years. How hugely the predetermination of sentences contributed to easing the thorny life of a judge. It wasn't so much a mental relief, in the sense that one didn't have to think, as it was a moral relief. You didn't have to torture yourself with worry that you might make a mistake in a sentence and make orphans out of your own little children. And the predetermination of sentences could dispose even so immovable a judge as Ulrich to good humour. And what major execution had he not pronounced? In 1945, the military collegium was hearing the case of the Estonian separatists. Short, stocky, good-humoured Ulrich was presiding. He didn't pass up a single opportunity to joke not only with his colleagues, but also with the prisoners. After all, that's what humaneness is, a new trait. Where had it ever been seen? Having learned that Susi was a lawyer, he said to him with a smile, Well, so now your profession can be of some use to you. Well, there is no need to quarrel. Why be embittered? The court routine proceeded pleasantly. They smoked right at the judge's table and at a convenient moment broke off for a good lunch. And when evening began to fall, they had to go and confer. But who confers at night? They left the prisoners to sit at their desks all night long and went on home. At nine in the morning they came in, all brisk and freshly shaved. Rise, the court is in session! And all the prisoners were given a ten-ruble bill apiece. And if anyone should object that the OSO at least proceeded without hypocrisy whereas there was hypocrisy in instances like the above, they pretended to be conferring, but didn't really confer. We would certainly have to enter a strong, very strong dissent. Well, the third and final characteristic is dialectics, which used to be crudely described in the folk saying, whichever way you point a wagon tongue, that's the way it goes. The code cannot be a dead weight in the path of the judge, the articles of the code had been around during ten, fifteen, twenty years of rapid change, and just as Faust said, the whole world changes and everything moves forward, and why should I be afraid to break my word? All the articles of the code had become encrusted with interpretations, directions, instructions, and if the actions of the accused are not covered by the code, he can still be convicted. By analogy, what opportunities? Simply because of origins, 735, belonging to a socially dangerous milieu. In the Republic of South Africa, terror has gone to such lengths in recent years that every suspicious SDE, socially dangerous element, black, can be arrested and held for three months without investigation or trial. 
Anyone can see immediately the flimsiness of this. Why not from three to ten years? For contacts with dangerous persons, this is something we hadn't known, something the newspaper Isbestia told us in July 1957. Here's scope for you. Who is dangerous and what contacts consist of only the judge can say. But one should not complain about the precise wording of our published laws either. On January the 13th, 1950, a decree was issued re-establishing capital punishment. One is bound, of course, to consider that capital punishment never did depart from barriers cellars. And the decree stated that the death sentence could be imposed on subversives, diversionists. What did that mean? It didn't say. Yosef Vissarionovich loved it that way. Not to say all of it, just to hint. Did it refer only to someone who blew up rails with TNT? It didn't say. We had long since come to know what a diversionist was. Someone who produced goods of poor quality was a diversionist. But what was a subversive? Was someone subverting the authority of the government, for example, in a conversation on a streetcar? Or if a girl married a foreigner, wasn't she subverting the majesty of our motherland? But it is not the judge who judges. The judge only takes his pay. The directives did the judging. The directive of 1937, ten years, twenty years, execution by shooting. The directive of 1943, twenty years at hard blood labor, hanging. The directive of 1945, ten years for everyone, plus five of disenfranchisement, manpower for three five-year plans. Babayev, in fact, a non-political, shouted at them, You can muzzle me for three hundred years, but I'll never lift my hand for you, you benefactors. The Directive of 1949. Everyone gets twenty-five. Thus it was that a real spy, Schultz in Berlin in 1948, could get ten years, and someone who had never been a spy, Günther Waschkau, got twenty-five, because he was in the wave of 1949. The machine stamped out the sentences. The prisoner had already been deprived of all right when they cut off his buttons on the threshold of state security, and he couldn't avoid a stretch. The members of the legal profession were so used to this that they fell on their faces in 1958 and caused a big scandal. The text of the projected new Fundamental Principles of Criminal Prosecution of the USSR was published in the newspapers, and they'd forgotten to include any reference to possible grounds for acquittal. The government newspaper issued a mild rebuke. The impression might be created that our courts only bring in convictions. Is best here, September the 10th, 1958. But just take the jurist's side for a moment. Why, in fact, should a trial be supposed to have two possible outcomes when our general elections are conducted on the basis of one candidate? An acquittal is, in fact, unthinkable from the economic point of view. It would mean that the informers, the security officers, the interrogators, the prosecutor's staff, the internal guard in the prison, and the convoy had all worked to no purpose. Here is one straightforward and typical case that was brought before a military tribunal. In 1941, the security operations branch of our inactive army stationed in Mongolia was called on to show its activity and vigilance. The military medical assistant, Lozovsky, who was jealous of Lieutenant Pavel Chulpenyev because of some woman, realized this. He addressed three questions to Chulpenyev when they were alone. One, why, in your opinion, are we retreating from the Germans? Chulpenyev's reply, they have more equipment and they were mobilized earlier. Lozovsky's counter, no, it's a maneuver, we're decoying them. Two. Do you believe the Allies will help? Chulpenyev. I believe they'll help, but not from unselfish motives. Lossovsky's counter. They are deceiving us. They won't help us at all. Three. Why was Voroshilov sent to command the Northwest Front? Chulpenyev answered and forgot about them, and Lossovsky wrote a denunciation... Chulpenyev was summoned before the political branch of the division and expelled from the Komsomol. 
for a defeatist attitude, for praising German equipment, for belittling the strategy of our high command. The loudest voice raised against him belonged to the Komsomol organizer Kalyagin, who had behaved like a coward at the Battle of Kalkin Gol in Chopanyev's presence, and therefore found it convenient to get rid of the witness once and for all. Chopanyev's arrest followed. He had one confrontation with Lozovsky. Their previous conversation was not even brought up by the interrogator. One question was asked. Do you know this man? Yes. Witness, you may leave. The interrogator was afraid the charge might fall through. Today, Lozovsky holds the degree of candidate in medical sciences and lives in Moscow. Everything is going well with him. Trupanyev drives a trolley bus. Depressed by his month's incarceration in the sort of hole in the ground we have already described, Trupanyev appeared before a military tribunal of the 36th Motorized Division. Present were Lebedev, the divisional political commissar, and Slesarev, the chief of the political branch. The witness, Lozovsky, was not even summoned to testify. However, after the trial to document the false testimony, they got Lozovsky's signature and that of political commissar Seryegin. The questions the tribunal asked were, Did you have a conversation with Lozovsky? What did he ask you about? What were your answers? Naively, Chulpenyev told them. He still couldn't understand what he was guilty of. After all, many people talk like that, he innocently exclaimed. The tribunal was interested. Who? Give us their names. But Chulpenyev was not of their breed. He had the last word. I beg the court to give me an assignment that will mean my death, so as to assure itself once more of my patriotism. And like a simple-hearted warrior of old, me and the person who slandered me, both of us together. Oh, no. Our job is to kill off all those chivalrous sentiments in the people. Lasovsky's duty was to hand out pills, and Seryegin's duty was to indoctrinate the soldiers. Viktor Andreevich Seryegin lives in Moscow today and works in a consumer service combine attached to the Moscow Soviet. He lives well. Whether or not you died wasn't important. What was important was that we were on our guard. The members of the military tribunal went out, had a smoke, and returned. Ten years plus three years disenfranchisement. There were certainly more than ten such cases in every division during the war. Otherwise, the military tribunals would not have justified the cost of maintaining them. And how many divisions were there in all? Let the reader count them up himself. The sessions of the military tribunals were depressingly like one another. The judges were depressingly faceless and emotionless rubber stamps. The sentences all came off the same assembly line. Everyone maintained a serious mien, but everyone understood it was a farce above all the boys of the convoy who were the simplest sort of fellows. At the Novosibirsk transit prison in 1945, they greeted the prisoners with a roll call based on cases. So and so... Article 58, 1A, 25 years. The chief of the convoy guard was curious. What did you get it for? For nothing at all. You're lying. The sentence for nothing at all is ten years. When the military tribunals were under pressure, their sessions lasted one minute, the time it took them to go out and come in again. When their working day went on for sixteen consecutive hours, one could see, through the door of the conference room, bowls of fruit on a table set with a white tablecloth. If they weren't in a hurry, they enjoyed delivering their sentence with a psychological twist. Sentenced to the supreme measure of punishment, and then a pause. The judges would look the condemned man in the eye. It was interesting to see how he took it. What was he feeling at that moment? Only then would the verdict continue. But taking into consideration the sincere repentance... On the walls of the waiting room, messages had been scratched with nails and scrawled in pencil. I got execution. I got twenty-five. I got a tenor. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette.